Okay, two microphones, good. Nice to be with you. My wife is here with me, Laverne, appreciate her coming. Nice to be able to share these discoveries. I mean, it's incredible what God has done. I've been following discoveries since 1984. I've never seen anything to contradict them. I've made uh, 16 overseas trips dealing with the discoveries. Everything is like what Ron White said, the evidence at these sites is just incredible. But some of the things we have up front, this is a model similar to what the Ark of the Covenant looks like according to Ron White's description. The mercy seat and the angels are connected together and they come up to open the inside of the Ark. The back of the Ark has an open top box here. This is where the Torah, Moses' law, would be placed in the back side of the ark. There's no lid on that. Uh, and this is described as the angels, uh, one on each end. They weren't sitting on top. If I need two guys to move a couch, I said, you guys go over there. I need one on each end. I didn't say on top. I need one on each end. That's what we have here, one on each end. And they're not on top of the ark. The mercy seat it's, it's the most holy. This is God's mercy seat here. They wouldn't be sitting on top of it. They're over the ark. They're leaning like this. And they have a, a wing extended here, one of the wings. So this does fit the uh, biblical description. We put together this model of the priest carrying the ark. It was the sons or probably grandsons too of Aaron that were to carry the ark. They would be within the tribe of Levi. And of course the ark would be covered in blue. Blue is a symbol of the, the law and so forth. And so underneath the covering would be the ark of the covenant that they would be carrying so carefully. And then we have here in the ark of the covenant cave, 
Mr. Wyatt, this is a, one of the things that he found in the cave. This is a model of it. Its exact length is what he found. It's 62 inches long. We'll see a Bible verse here where it's mentioned that it was kept with the tabernacle, Goliath's sword. And there's three things very interesting about it. First thing, of course, is the, is the length of it. You know, 62 inches long, five feet, two inches. Another thing are the side barbs. And someone emailed me and said, those are for slashing and it would, it would catch on someone's uh, shield, for instance, grab it and it's knocking it away. And then uh, again, the length of it is exactly three royal Egyptian cubits in length. That would be the Philistines using the royal Egyptian cubit. That's the same cubit that was used uh, that Moses described Noah's Ark as having been 300 cubits in length. And that would be using the royal Egyptian cubit, 20.62 inches. And we'll get into that after lunch with Noah's Ark. And then this has some hand guards here on either side. These are designed to catch an opponent's a sword would come down here and get caught in this. And you could, you know, he's so large, he could just kick him down. He was, uh, if he used the Royal Egyptian cubit, Goliath was, as Ellen White says, it matches what she said, approaching 12 feet tall. And, you know, you're talking somebody 800 pounds, you know, minimum, something like that. So, but we'll see a Bible verse relating to uh, David going to the tabernacle and borrowing the last sword from the priest there. And then now we have the Ten Commandments stones, as Mr. Wyatt described. He said that there's no spaces between the words. It's continuous writing. And this would be early or Paleo-Hebrew here. And it starts at the right and goes to the left. Like this is the first commandment here, the second commandment, and it ends here. And in the third commandment, the first four commandments are on one table of stone. And so the third commandment ends here and the fourth commandment comes all the way down here. So first through fourth are on the first tablet. Six through 10 are here on the second tablet. And it looks like, Ron said, it looks like that God was writing in butter. If you can imagine writing in butter, an indentation, and maybe it's welling up on the sides. If you can imagine, you know, drawing through butter. And so that is the, this is Paleo-Hebrew here. Ron Wyatt said that it was Proto-Aramaic, the writing, which is similar to this. Uh, Paleo-Hebrew came from uh, the Aramaic. Um, the Ten Commandments are also described as the Ten Words. So these are continuous writing as if each commandment is one word here. And I asked him if it had a curved top. He says, no, they're not curved and they're not blue. From what I understand, he told a couple of friends of mine that they're granite, granite stone. We ordered some granite, it didn't come in on time, but, and then they're connected by two gold rings. And Ella White does say in heaven that the Ten Commandments are connected by two gold rings. So the ones on earth are just like that. And Mr. White did say that they're not large. Some people, you know, may have them depicted as, that'd be kind of hard, you know, for Moses to carry, the larger they are, carry stone up, up and down the mountain and so forth. So that's what we have here. And if we could start with the presentation here. So the Ark of the Covenant, as Pastor Herbert was saying, this is the most exciting discovery ever, you know, in the history of the world, you could say, is the Ark of the Covenant being found because of the evidence that it holds. And we'll see that it's a holding place for evidence, the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, so we just came from Charlotte, uh, Shabbat Night Live, Michael Rood, A Rood Awakening. Uh, we filmed six shows there with them. And you can see in their studio here, 
On the left, you can see our setup with the uh, eight priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And so they got a bunch of nice uh, photos out of this, some video roll. So it was nice sharing with them. But so now we've mentioned that there's four other major discoveries that Mr. White found, the Noah's Ark, the Sodom and Gomorrah, top right, bottom left is the Red Sea crossing, and we see the Mount Sinai, bottom right. And so these are the things that Ron Wyatt worked on previously. And then he had the report, a report about having gone into the cave and seen the things we're gonna see here regarding the Ark of the Covenants, hear about his report. So his credibility was established by, seeing, by uh, finding the other discoveries. We could see God was using him. We mentioned this in the first program how uh, if God was using him on the other four, we need to listen to his report on the fifth because God would not use a liar to talk about the Ark of the Covenant. You know, if he were lying, God would never have used him to start with. God knows the future. And so his credibility was established through these other discoveries. God was using him. He worked on these discoveries 22 years. He worked as a nurse Methodist, but most of the money he made, he spent it on these discoveries. He spent we estimate a million dollars of his own money while living in a duplex. He was devoted to doing this work over 120 trips overseas. So this is our intro to the Ark of the Covenant. That's in the dig for the second tunnel. his sons. This is the Temple Mount at night. This is near the Western Wall, the garden tomb where Jesus was laid to rest. This is where Jesus walked out. You have to be there, friend. This is the most holy place. The ark was on the right side. The Shekinah glory over the mercy seat. This is the wall in Zedekiah's cave, and the Ark of the Covenant is described by Ron Wyatt. So we know in Hebrews 4 that Jesus is our high priest in the most holy place in heaven. There's an Ark of the Covenant up there in heaven, and inside it are God's original Ten Commandments. That which is down here on earth is a copy or a replica of what's in heaven, you know, same proportion and size. We know that Lucifer rebelled, Adam and Eve, they were cast from the garden, our first parents. It's very sad. But God made a way through the sacrificial system when Adam and Eve first sinned, and Jesus offered himself to ultimately be the Passover lamb. That's what he was. So when they made it to Mount Sinai, they were there for a year, but during that time, they made a tabernacle set up in the furnishings of the tabernacle there at Mount Sinai. The Hebrew nation, slaves in Egypt for over 200 years, triumphantly throw off their chains of bondage and find freedom through the miracles of God worked through a man named Moses. When they arrived at the foot of a mountain called Sinai to worship this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their forefathers, they will come face to face with their creator and experience a supernatural event that will change the world forever. One and a half tons of gold, Five and a half tons of silver, four tons of bronze, five thousand board feet of lumber, eighteen hundred square yards of fabric, and a detailed model that God shows to Moses will all come together into a life-size portable structure. This is God's sanctuary, his home on earth where he can personally visit with man. Over the course of time, its true meaning and purpose has almost been forgotten, leaving behind mysteries and religions that persist to this day. Yet its mysteries can be unraveled and its secrets revealed. By combining biblical and archaeological evidence, state-of-the-art computer visualization, we can travel back in time and see the creation of this sanctuary. Every piece, every part, has a symbolic meaning, telling the story of God's plan to rescue man from his own self-destruction. 
This sanctuary unites ancient Judaism with modern Christianity, pointing to Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. So this is the tabernacle set up with the outside courtyard, the brazen altar that you first come to, uh, the laver of water. After that, you enter the holy place. You see the golden lampstand on the south side here to the left. On the right, you see the table of showbread. On the northern wall, table of showbread. And then on the other side, the veil from the Ark of the Covenant was to sit the altar of incense. So the Ark of the Covenant will be on the other side of the veil from this. In Leviticus 16, on the Day of Atonement, sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. They did that once a year on the Day of Atonement. We'll see that a little bit later. And God would tell them to cast the blood toward the east. We'll look into that. But the Babylonian army surrounded Jerusalem in 586 BC. This was God was going to let them go into bondage. The city was going to be sacked. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it. And they built a siege wall all around the outside of the city. The city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah, 2 Kings 25. So the Babylonian army uh, sieged the city and then they, they attacked it. The bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord, these are the things that were taken that's mentioned here. Second Kings, the bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord, the carts, the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried their bronze to Babylon. They also take, took away the pots, the shovels, the trimmers. These are things used in the tabernacle or temple service, the spoons and all the bronze utensils with which the priests ministered. Okay, but where is the Ark of the Covenant mentioned? It's not mentioned. So what happened to the main temple furnishings? What happened to them? Now, in the Apocrypha, in 2 Maccabees 2, it says, Jeremiah found a cave dwelling. He carried the tent, the ark, the incense altar into it. This is before the destruction of the city. Then blocked up the entrance. Some of his companions came to mark out the way, the way of where it was hidden, but were unable to find it. When Jeremiah learned of this, he reprimanded them. The place shall remain unknown, he said, until God finally gathers his people together and shows mercy to them. Then the Lord will bring these things to light again. Now, Ella White mentions, because of Israel's transgression of the commandments of God and their wicked acts, God suffered them to go into captivity to humble and punish them. That's really sad. When we apostatize, there are results, aren't there? Before the temple was destroyed, God made known to a few of his faithful servants the fate of the temple, which was the pride of Israel and which they regarded with idolatry while they were sinning against God. He also revealed to them the captivity of Israel. These righteous men, just before the destruction of the temple, removed the sacred ark containing the tables of stone and with mourning and sadness, secreted it in a cave where it was to be hid from the people of Israel because of their sins and was to be no more restored to them. That sacred ark is yet hid. It has never been disturbed since it was secreted. So she's saying it was hidden in a cave and she's saying, you know, in her day it had not been disturbed. So is there a future, a future for the ark and its contents? And he, Christ, gave it to Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony. It's God's testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Nothing written on those tables could be blotted out. The precious record of the law was placed in the Ark of the Testimony and is still there, safely hidden from the human family the tables of stone, but in God's appointed time, he will bring forth these tables of stone. Now, what's the antecedent of these? These, these, these tables of stone from Mount Sinai. These Mount Sinai tables of stone to be a testimony to all the world against the disregard of his commandments and against the idolatrous worship 
of a counterfeit Sabbath. What's that counterfeit Sabbath? The Sunday law. These tables of stone from Mount Sinai will come out for the world to see during the Sunday law, guaranteed. Okay, now if they're gonna come out, who has to find them? God partners with man to get things done. The first step of those stones coming out was Ron Wyatt taking them out of the Ark of the Covenant that we'll hear. The angels lifted the mercy seat. They said, reach in and take the Ten Commandments out. The world needs to see them. So these Ten Commandments will come out as a challenge to the civil Sunday law. Everybody's going to be in trouble. Everybody. Either be in trouble with the government for not following their law or in trouble with God for not following his law. So here we are in the old city of Jerusalem. We're walking north to the Damascus Gate is on the north side of the old city. We exit the gate and turn around and look back at the pretty uh, Damascus Gate here on the north side of the old city of Jerusalem. Now, if you go up on the wall and turn around and look north, you will see the place of the skull where the yellow arrow is here. This is a rock escarpment. It continues around to the left and that's where we see where the crucifixion site was. We know he was crucified near the place of the skull, Gorgotha. If you continue around to the left, is a crucifixion site. Continue around further, and it kind of goes around in an alcove, and that's the garden tomb that we're going to look at. Here's a close-up of the skull face. There's kind of a nose extending out on this. It's the two right dark eye sockets there. On the garden tomb grounds, there's an overlook. You can look out and see the skull face. In front of it here is a, a Palestinian bus station. And this hill here is considered part of Mount Moriah. There's more of a close-up of the skull face. Now, Mount Moriah is this shaded area where the red arrow is, is area near the crucifixion area. Now, we know that in 2000 uh, BC, Abraham was asked to sacrifice Isaac. But God said, I will provide a sacrifice, didn't he? It wasn't just the ram in the thicket. It was his own son, 2000 years later on this same hill, the same hill, Mount Moriah, where Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac, God instead provided his own sacrifice, his own son. Jesus died at that exact same hill. It's, it's amazing. Now north, outside the gate, John 19, he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. We saw the place of the skull. That's to the north of the old city, Leviticus 1. If the burnt offering is a sheep, lamb, kill it, on the north side of the altar. This area is north of the temple, north of the temple mount. Hebrews 13, we have an altar outside the gate. And that's where Jesus was crucified, outside the gate. John 19, 41, now is the place where he was crucified. There was a garden and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So this verse is telling us there's a crucifixion area, crucified. There's a garden near there, and there's a new tomb. So all these need to be near each other, and we're going to see it here in the garden tomb grounds there. We'll see the tomb, and the crucifixion site is over to our right, about uh, 50 yards or so, and then past that is the place of the skull. So this is the entrance when you go into the garden tomb grounds. They have a wall around the entire complex. They get hundreds of thousands of tourists each year. Mr. Wyatt didn't find this. This was found like in the 1870s, 1880s. It's described as having a very large stone and this appears to have 
used a very large stone. And this is the, the track that the stone rolled back and forth in here. It's very wide, you know, approximately 16 inches, something like that. And it has an angled left edge here to keep the stone in place and get it doesn't bind while running in the track there. This was all cut out of solid limestone. And also the tomb itself was all carved out. To the left here is the area where they would have practiced foot washing. They would sit on the right ledge here and put their feet down in here. That's what it's assumed was used for. To the left of the door is the end of this iron rod where the angel broke off this rod that was sealing the rolling stone. It could not roll back because of this iron rod here. And the angel came down and broke off that rod and the stone could be pushed back. Then when you enter, this is called the weeping chamber, the immediate, immediate chamber here on the left. So again, this is all carved out of the solid stone. And then to the right are these two crypts. This is one where Jesus was laid right here. The right hand area of it has been extended because he was taller than Joseph of Arimathea. This is approximately six feet, four inches in length. And then there's a right hand one here that they say has not been used. This is a replica of a cross that used to be up there. They've plastered over it to kind of keep water out, but that's what an old cross there looked like. So again, this is the carving out of the cave or the tomb. And on the door it says, he is not here for he is risen. And this is where Jesus, you can walk in the exact spot where he walked out triumphant. This is number one place on earth to visit is the garden tomb and the grounds there. So this is the setting for the crucifixion area and the Ark of the Covenant that's underground This is the front of the facade there, and you can see a cross that's been carved out. They call this an anchor cross. This would be hundreds of years old. I don't know the exact date on it. And then there's an underground cistern here holding 250,000 gallons. So this shows there was an ancient garden in this area. Again, that John 19 mentioned that there was a garden, a new tomb, and a crucifixion area. And this reservoir, here's an image of it inside there with people on a ladder extending down. And then straight out from the tomb, about 60 feet, is this wine press. It's one of the largest in the Jerusalem area. And now this is on around back toward the skull face. This is a crucifixion area. There are cutouts in the rock over here to the left. We'll be seeing more of this. But behind the benches there are cutouts in the rock where the signs were placed, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Again, Golgotha is to our right. <coughs> so these are the cutouts in the stone where the signs were placed. The crucifixion site is below that table about 14 feet. 
is crucifixion all cross all so this is a very holy area up above up on top of the stone there the rock escarpment is this huge crack evidence of a major earthquake matching the biblical record. Here's a crucifixion area where the benches are and the table is below that. And then we're heading toward the place of the skull. He's running for his life. And you go up these steps here and there's this overlook. So there's the place of the skull we can see. See here. So these things are all together as mentioned in John 19. This was found by General Gordon in the 1880s, Golgotha. He did some excavating in the area. So Mr. Wyatt worked here in the garden tomb grounds for many years. It took him three years to locate the, the Ark of the Covenant. So 1978 was his first visit to the garden tomb grounds. They had just come from Nueva, Egypt, where they were scuba diving for chariot wheel parts and they encountered Dr. Dan Bahat in the garden tomb. And Ron told him about what they had found with the chariot wheels and also Noah's Ark the year before. And Dr. Bahat says, why don't you walk through here and see if you see something interesting. So Ron's going to tell us. I had an unusual experience. The Lord had helped me find the remains of Noah's Ark. He had helped me find the remains of the Egyptian chariot parts and horse parts and people parts in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba. And I had gone to the Middle East with my sons, we had friends as divers, scuba divers, and we were going to get some of chariot parts out. Well, due to my carelessness, I got sunburned to the point that my legs swelled up, my feet, and all this, and I couldn't get my diving equipment off. So I was up in Jerusalem, hobbling around, feeling very, very rained on. Waiting for my cheap airline ticket the day that it was on it to arrive so we could fly home. We didn't have the money to change that ticket. And uh, during this time, I was hobbling around the city a little bit. And one day I met this archaeologist who was in charge of the Jerusalem area there. And uh, why he should be talking to me, I don't have a clue. Uh, I didn't look very presentable. We uh, were staying in a new hostel, sleeping in our clothes. I'm sure I didn't smell very good. Maybe I was fortunate enough that he was upwind from me or something. But anyway, we got into a conversation and I told him about Noah's Ark. And, uh, explain to him how the pyramids were built, and that seemed to uh, get his attention. So he says, I've been doing some digging along this cliff face here. He says, how about coming along with me and, and have a look at it and see what you think? So I was walking along, looking at these were Roman ruins and remains, and my left hand suddenly pointed out at a grubby looking hole in the rock where there was garbage, Two dead cats, uh, just un that was in nest and stuff. And my mouth said, that's Jeremiah's grotto and the Ark of the Covenant was in there. This guy said, that's wonderful. He said, we will let you excavate there and we'll provide you a place to stay, your food, your laundry. I can, you know, understand why he mentioned laundry. <laughs> And I was 
stunning because I had not been thinking about the Ark of the Covenant at all. You know, wondering why on earth we hadn't been able to get some chariot wheels out. You see, I pray about everything, folks. I did back then, too. I knew I was supposed to be there. But what I thought I was supposed to be there for was not what I was supposed to be there for. So anyway, our ticket was due to the day that uh, finally arrived, and it was the next morning after we had this conversation, or after I had the conversation with this man. So I said, well, that's great. I'll come back and do that. Now I've got to go home, you know, and make some preparations. So anyway, I went home wondering why on earth the Ark of the Covenant could possibly be in that place. So I read in chapter, or rather in 2 Kings chapter 25, where it says that the whole city was surrounded by a siege wall. So anyway, I became persuaded that the Ark of the Covenant was in that place because I knew some supernatural force that used my arm and my legs. When it first happened, I didn't know what you mean. And we're instructed to try the spirits to see whether they be in God. We can't flatter ourselves and say anything that comes out of my mouth because I pray all of this. And anything I say must be from God. We have to check it against the law of the testimony regardless of where it comes from, even ourselves. But what I discovered when I started excavating down that cliff wall, first of all, I discovered the cutouts in the wall of the cliff where they had posted the signs, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. I found the crossovers in a place that I had no idea they would be. That was at the base of that cliff. Of course, now that we found them and realized that that's where the public road went back and forth through there. It was, you know, the ideal place for a crucifixion. Had to be, otherwise, the Romans probably wouldn't have chosen it. So, Ron's sons here are going to tell about their father uh, first seeing this garden tomb area in 1978. They saw the cutouts in the rock escarpment and they saw his father raise his arm. And, uh, it came across the quote from Maccabees about Jeremiah having his uh, servant secreted in a cave and all that. And uh, we kind of, whatever, I kind of said, Dad, how come we don't go find that? You know, you, you already found Noah's Ark. That's, you know. <laughs> no, this was before. Before that even happened, yeah. And and he said, Dad started questioning it then. He goes, well, I don't even know if it's still down here. It, I don't know if it's in heaven or not. Some people think it's in heaven. Some people think it's down here. And he started studying up on it. And then we went back overseas, and we went to the garden tomb, you know, just to look at it, basically. And that when it was just the tour, his arm went under it. And... He said, you know, that's, and at the time when we walked in there, dad said, see those cutouts? And you yeah. remember? Mm -hmm. And this was like the first time we had ever seen the garden tomb. And dad walked around there, showed him, pointed his finger, then he showed us the cutouts. So they affirm, you know, what Mr. Wyatt was saying about his arm being raised and uh, the supernatural, you know, experience he had. So. This is amazing. In a short period of time, 77, he found the Noah's Ark site with, as we said in the first program, God stalling their taxi where they needed to get out and look. Uh, in 78, he found the Red Sea crossing with the chariot wheel parts there. He then knew Mount Sinai had to be over in Saudi Arabia. If you know where the crossing site is and you look across, well, there's Saudi Arabia. That's Midian. Midian is where Mount Sinai should be. He went there in 1984. So in 1978, he also, on, the, on this trip that he mentioned, he went up to Jerusalem and had this supernatural experience with God saying, there's Jeremiah's grotto, the Ark of the Covenant is in there. So 
these four, he basically knew approximately where these four finds were located, you know, within a period of, of you know, 12 to 18 months. It's amazing. God put this in his lap to work on. Now, in the Israel Museum, there is this ivory pomegranate. It's the only known object from the first temple. This is one of the things Ron White found in his excavation. It was in a tunnel uh, before you get to the Ark Cave. And it says on the shoulder of it, it says, Holy to the priest in the temple of Yahweh. And this is one of the items, whenever he would find something, he would turn it over to the Israel Antiquities Authority. And they're the ones who hold it today. Now, it was a short time after that, they had this in a storage room. And that storage room was raided. Somebody went there and stole a bunch of stuff out. And it's documented that they had to buy this back from a French antiquities dealer for 550000 so they knew it was authentic. They knew where it came from. It came from Ron's dig. And so they put out big money to get their hands back on it. And this would have been like in late 79 or so. So the dig for the Ark, Ron in 1982, he got to the Ark cave, but then he had to come up with a more direct route to get into the cave because it was like a hundred feet going down vertical shafts, crossing a 40 foot drop bridge on a board scooting across, coming back up um, chimneys and so forth. And so he thought, well, if I'm ever gonna get anything out of there, we gotta have a more direct route. And so he spent a huge amount of money working on a second tunnel. And this is some of the video of them working down in the tunnel system when he's working on a second tunnel. from the first temple. Now we accomplished that by going down through this hole here that's about 40 foot deep and then coming out there back up into a chimney in a speed on their terminology and then squeezing on into the chamber. We broke our way in through uh, a hole underground and came back up. I mean, it was a real way around. But once you got in this chamber, there sat a door right at the end of the chamber. And the people that brought this thing in busted a chunk of stone that was dug out from behind it, laid it down, cut a doorway out in there, carried this stuff in. And then they covered them with animal skins, and then they covered them with wooden boards and then stones. They packed that thing full of stones back out and showed that chunk of rock back in place and filled in behind it. And today from the outside, it just looks like a crack that an earthquake made and there's a lot of those in that scar. Now, if it were just simply getting into the chamber, we could do that. But once we get in there, we have to have the ability to get all of those things out of that chamber and safely to the surface. So, it's not like just treasure hunting where you go in and, and get whatever is there and take it out. We have to consider taking care of the objects that are beyond this wall. <laughs> and we're bringing the uh, radar scan It's a radar scanner. That's right. It's going to take about a minute for the scan. All right. Well, I'm going to start.
Now, I think these must be cracks in the rocks. These little white lines going through there must be cracks or something. From here to here, the, the uh, transducer is stationary. So that's all the same, all the way down. And it looks like there's a cavern there. Cavern. Hmm. Which I don't know what scale you had on, so you can work out how deep it is from the surface or from where the transducer is to the cavern, if you know what scale and you've calibrated to that scale. So this is an easy work. I mean, and then to be criticized as somehow forty feet down. Forty feet down. An old wall. All right, at this point, uh, you are 45 feet under the ground. Uh, all of the debris above us is from the many different destruction levels of Jerusalem. In antiquity, when a city got destroyed, instead of coming back and moving all the debris away and starting from bedrock, they would just level off what was left of the city and start it from that point on up. And Jerusalem has been destroyed at least 10 times throughout antiquity. And we are down at right here is the pre-Babylonian area, uh, our strata. Now, what I wanted to point out to you here is in front of me, you see some large stones that are blocking an entrance into a chamber. Now, in order to conceal the chamber, they couldn't just block the chamber entrance itself. Otherwise, this would call attention to it. So they put up a veneer that went around the escarpment some distance. And this would at least confuse anybody that was looking for an entrance and perhaps make them believe that the stone veneer was there for some other reason. Now, in this particular quarry and in many others from antiquity, they would cut the stone back until they came to chambers or where the water had eroded and dissolved the stone away. This type of material was unusable for their purposes in cutting uh, out good, uh, strong blocks of stone for building purposes. So when uh, they cut into these chambers, they would go around and leave a thin wall uh, between the chamber and the outside, taking all the good stone away. So this is the situation that we're looking at here and that we have looked at in several other areas in this particular cave complex. Now, uh, this wall here was put up very hastily. They have had mortar uh, back to Babylonian and pre-Babylonian times. And this wall, as you will see, instead of mortar, uh, they used some red clay. Now this tells us that they did all of this in quite a hurry. So given all of this information and the fact that I was in a chamber in this uh, general location, uh, however it is a little confusing once you crawl around through these tunnels to try to keep oriented if you don't have a compass on you. But our radar, our subsurface interface radar scanner shows that there is a chamber uh, approximately 18 inches behind this wall. And one of the shots that we got from the side showed a level of uh, contents in the chamber uh, with uh, less than contents near the bottom. 
And in experimentation, we find that this usually represents something that's standing on legs or up on some sort of a pedestal. And we're going to attempt to put a hole through there with this drill. All right, now, as we are down here with a lot of debris over us, quite enough to bury us. Uh, and some future archaeologists at time last long, would, long enough would find our remains. That is too much vibration down in this area would trigger earth slides, which we have experienced several of. So it's a lot of work, yeah, doing, and that's the second tunnel. I mean, if you're fraud, all you need is one tunnel. Why go through a lot of effort doing a second tunnel? He spent a lot of uh, time working on this, the second tunnel. Later, he understood that the items need to stay in the cave, that God is gonna use this as a permanent arrangement. It'll be available in the new earth also. Now, this is the image they got, this uh, open white area represents uh, the cave that they saw through the radar. Now in the Garden Tomb bookstore, they had this book with the notes by General Charles Gordon who found the Golgotha site. He did some excavating right there where Mr. Wyatt has excavated. These were notes from uh, General Charles Gordon from the 1880s. And he said, the ark I suspect is in Jeremiah's grotto. The Jews have a tradition, it is under the dome of the rock, but I think it's under the true altar of the skull where tradition places Jeremiah's writing of lamentations. Jeremiah wrote Lamentations in the cave. The Ark of the Covenant is there. And he said, Golgotha on hill was Jeremiah's grotto. The hill is outside the gates near the city where many roads pass. From a long time back, the slaughterhouse of city has been there. It is north of city, showbread table is in it. And this is where the arrow is, is where the crucifixion area is. And just to the right of it is the traditional Jeremiah's Grotto. So uh, General Gordon was there excavating where the arrow is and so was Mr. Wyatt. Israel Antiquities Authority on their website, this was around 2006, I saw this on the website. The excavation was conducted south of a natural bedrock outcrop. This is a 2006 excavation they're talking about. That was identified by General Gordon in 1883 as Golgotha. In the 1980s, Ron Wyatt excavated several underground chambers at the site. The current excavation cleaned and documented the former chambers and additional chambers were excavated. So they're confirming Mr. Wyatt found chambers in years past. This is the cross hole that Ron Wyatt speaks of. The square area here, this is the, the top of the crowbar, the handle. This is a crack where Jesus' blood went down 20 feet into the cave where the Ark of the Covenant rests. We'll hear more about that. These are the cutouts in the rock once again, and the signs would have been placed, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Now Ron's gonna talk about his excavating and going down to the cave itself. Need to play this just a second. It's not playing. straight down. So as we tunneled along at the quarry floor, at the base of the wall, 
and I found the cross hall. And I worked around and found some more cross holes four feet lower on the real far end floor. I prayed, Lord, where shall I go now? I was impressed to break right through the cliff. Not this cliff, but one that looked every bit as solid. Right? Well, <clears throat> I'm dumb, but I didn't think I was that dumb. I knew there were caves in there because honeybees were coming out of cracks and flying in. So they had their nest in there. And my older son is rather quiet person. He said, Dad, did you pray about this? I said, sure. Yes, I did. He said, well, I said, I was impressed to break through that cliff right there. And he said, well, that's stupid. And I said, no, that's stupid. I am not beat my brains out against the cliff. He said, well, Dad, pardon my saying so, but I've seen you do stupider things than me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, I don't run into it. Pass the tool bow down. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see a crack right here. Right, it's not much of one, but it is a fault line through that stone. So we went 18 inches over to this side, took our hammers and chisels, and started marking the stone up and down and up and down. Finally, a big chunk popped out of there, pushed it off to the side, and looked back in the bottom. There was a small dark hole about that big. It didn't look very promising at all. I had my son hand me the flashlight. We had had him sitting where we could see. This was all down in the tunnel. And so I put it up to that hole, and there was a big cave chamber back behind there. Have you ever had goosebumps and all that sort of thing? This overwhelmed you. Well, that's what happened to me. It didn't take us very long to make the hole big enough to get in. I thought the Ark of the Covenant would be sitting right there. I thought that. Okay. So since we had to leave the next morning, you know, we plugged that hole. We came back to the surface, plugged the hole, picked everything up so nobody could tell where we had been, and left. I had to go home, work, save up some more money, come back. But eventually, I found the Ark of the Covenant, and it was in a chamber that I would not have bothered going in, just like I wouldn't have bothered breaking through the wall. The, the little Arab guy that was letting us eat at his restaurant, he was a full grown man, but he's about that tall and small. So as we went through this cave system, he would crawl into the chambers and I'd give him a light and he would shine around and I'd peek through to see if it looked like he was down in there. So we did this over and over, and uh, we came to this one hole that we, I mean, we wouldn't believe where all we had gone in that cave. We had just been all over the place, up and down, different levels. And at this point in time, we had gone about 45 feet down and then back up. And here this hole was in the wall, not that big around. And there was a stalactite hanging right down the middle of it. The only stalactite I had seen in the cave that wasn't just loose. This was a big one. So I broke it off, made the hole big enough for him to get in, and he was crawling in there. And I started to hand him the light so he understood what we had been doing. You know, several days. He came tearing out of there. His eyes were big as human eyes can get. And he said, What's in there? What's in there? I'm not going to let in there. And I said, Well, what did you see? He said, I didn't see anything. And I thought, Well, okay. Now he'd been in tighter places too much and had not responded that way. So I got this little be my life, you know, in a dark place here. <laughs> and I thought, that is divine terror. You know, that's supernatural. 
So I figured that if we got to that, this either what the argument is coming in is, or it's a way to get to the point of one or the other. And God doesn't want this fellow to know. So I made the hole big enough for me to get in. I got in there, and folks, it was full of rocks. Bigger than these here. When I found the Ark of the Covenant in that uh, chamber, all of the furnishings had been covered by a layer of animal skins. On top of that, a layer of wooden boards. And on top of that, enough stones to fill the rest of the chamber up to near the roof. Up to within 18 inches or so of the seat. If this young man had been terrorized and kind of scooting out of there like he did, I would not have gone in that so we had thousands of them for three years. So anyway, I crawled in there with a flashlight, and I crawled around on top of the rocks, and I shone the light down between the cracks in the rock, and there a gold, black gold thing and reflected back at me. So I moved over and shined down to the nose. There was two reflections, one here, one there, and one over here. So I knew it was a black gold top. And I thought, the Ark of the Covenant, I forgot about the cherubim, you know, sitting on top of it and then poking up the <laughs> top of the mercy seat. But anyway, I started moving these rocks and I had stuff them everywhere I could. By the time I got down to that gold surface, I had them behind my shoulders, leaning back against them. And uh, it turned it was the table of sugar. <laughs> well, hey, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> but anyway, I was looking for the Ark of the Covenant. And it was only then that I took time to carefully examine the rest of the chamber. The I just crawled in, took a quick look, and started checking down on the rock. So as I moved the flashlight along the wall, I saw a stone box sitting against the wall about this low, this much space between it and the ceiling. The lid was broke, slid around, and right above it was a crack with a dark brown looking material at the bottom of, on the bottom of this crack. And I was able to see the top of the lid at the bottom. On both sides of the broken pieces was more of this brown stuff. All of a sudden, I realized I was sitting in front of the Ark of the Covenant, and that Christ was. Then I saw the dry blood on the lid that had been busted and split around, and the dry blood on both sides was broken. So I knew the blood had gone in, but I knew in my heart the Ark of the Covenant was in there, but I didn't know about the prophecy. That once I regained consciousness, after I was, became aware that the blood of Christ had gone on the mercy seat, you know, I hadn't a clue. And when I started digging up looking for the Ark of the Covenant, I had no idea that was the crucifixion site. I found that out, out as I dug down that as far as. And so anyway, when, when I realized this, I passed out, when I regained consciousness, here I was in this hole way down in the earth, had to go 90 feet approximately to get out of there back to the surface. We found this January 6, 1982 at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. When Christ died in the earth, the shook and the rocks were ran to crack came right down the entire face of the escarpment, right past the left side of the cross hole, and the stone opened up. Down below, 20 feet below, God had arranged for the Ark of the Covenant with its mercy seat to be placed his earthly throne to, to be positioned right down there 600 years before in 586 B.C., when the Babylonian army destroyed the city, when the centurion stuck his spear in Christ's spleen and probably left Ventricle to make sure he was dead before he gave the body to Joseph of Arimathea, when he pulled that spear out, the separated platelets and serum 
of the blood of the Son of God, which thou went down through that crack onto the mercy seat, and that ratified the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Quite amazing. Now we're told here in Matthew 27, Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, the rocks were rent. We see here at the top of the escarpment, the huge crack. This is the escarpment. Uh, you can see cracks in the face here. There's the cutouts in the rock. I'm standing over the site where the cross hole is below me here. You can see again the cutouts. So the Ark of the Covenant would be where I'm standing and the cross hole. So he did two tunnels. The first tunnel completed in 82, and then he dug another second tunnel, uh, which took a great deal of work. So we were told around the time of Solomon that nothing was in the ark except the two tables of stone, which Moses put there, Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel. So we're told by inspiration that the golden pot of manna and the Aaron's rod that budded were taken to heaven. And so just the Ten Commandments, this would have been about uh, 3,000 years ago, only the Ten Commandments were in the ark. And then the ark opens up uh, like this. Now, how was the ark positioned in the most holy place? Speaking of uh, the devil wanting to be like God, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Satan wants to have his throne in the sides on the north. That's where the Ark of the Covenant sat, on the north side. And the east here would be to the right, the west would be to the left. And that's how you would split the mercy seat in half evenly, is if the Ark is on the north side. Here we have a diagram, the altar of incense would sit on the other side of the veil, directly near the Ark of the Covenant. Now Leviticus 16, he shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. This is the high priest, day of atonement. And before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. So when the priest came in, God would instruct him to cast the blood to the east, to the right side, this right side of the mercy seat for hundreds of years. The blood was going there to the left a vacant western side. I guarantee you those high priests understood someday the blood of the Messiah will go on this western side of the mercy seat. And that it did. It was clear of any blood from animals, so it kept a nice vacant area for the Messiah to apply his blood. Now the golden candlestick has actually got branches sticking out from it. It's in a, like a tree. It's described as having branches, buds, flowers, and Ron described it as having branches, six branches going out and then a center uh, place for a candlestick. So how was the ark secreted in 586 BC? This is the way it could have been taken down through Zedekiah's cave. You can go there today. It's a cave underneath the city of the old city of Jerusalem today. This is kind of a map of it, a map of it underground. <clears throat> Most of the cave was created by carving out rocks to use in building of the temple and so forth. And they left certain pillars basically in there to keep supporting the ceiling. And you can pay four or five dollars and go down in here and you can see straight lines. You can see the ceiling is straight across here and you see vertical lines where they were cutting out stone inside Zedekiah's cave. It's interesting to explore. We've been way back in here and you see more straight lines across the ceiling here. And these would be basically pillars they would leave behind. But uh, again, we, we see this quote here where Jeremiah found a cave dwelling, carried the ark, uh, the tent, the incense altar into it. Then he blocked up the entrance. Some of his companions came to mark out the way inside this Zedekiah's cave. You can see where they had uh, cut out a carving. It says here it was removed, but it was found in 1874, this cherub carved figure. And it was depicting an animal with a human head and a winged lion's body. And it was taken to a museum in London. And this is it in London. 
So this is Jeremiah's men carved this out to mark the way when they were hiding the Ark of the Covenant. And this is kind of a, a sketch of it. But about 40 feet past that sign is this man-made wall where the Ark of the Covenant would have been taken down this direction. And they put up this wall about 40 feet across, just blocking the whole area off. And it's very thick. They tried to drill through it, and they, they can't get to the other side, basically. So this is in Zedekiah's cave. The area is blocked off. You can't get to this. So this is a very important video. The fourth trip I made into this chamber, it was spotless. <clears throat> the furnishings were set in perfect order. The Ark of the Covenant, however, had been placed against the wall, the end of the cave. The end of the cave was a beautiful crystal radiating the colors of the rainbows. Now, I know New Age and all that goes in for rainbows, so the homosexuals and all that. But God used it first, all right? It's around his throne. And it's around his earthly throne. Now, there's no veil in this setup. So it is the earthly, it's God's temple on earth, or his residence where he once dwelt. And uh, anyway, when I found it like this, there were four young men standing in there. And I started to say, you know, what are you doing here? And I froze. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe, couldn't do anything. One of the people said, we are the four angels that have been taking care of the ark since Moses put the tables of stone in it, right? And they instructed me to set up my video camera with the tripod aim it at the ark of the covenant. And they went over, lifted the mercy seat up. I don't know how heavy it is. I've never tried to lift it, but it's solid gold. And the angel said, take the tables of stone out of there. God wants everyone to see those. I took them out, right? They put the mercy seat back down over the Ark of the Covenant. I backed away a little bit. The angel came, got the tables of stone, put them on the rock ledge inside the chamber. And I was then instructed to take a sample of the blood from the mercy seat, have that analyzed, and I did everything the angel told me to do. Real quickly, okay, uh, dried blood is dead blood. Everybody knows that, all right? They can test the blood of the pharaohs, the mummies of the pharaohs, all right? There are certain things they can do. They cannot get a chromosome count by any method I'm familiar with, all right? Things keep changing. I don't profess to know everything. However, there's no way I know that you can get a chromosome count out of dead blood. You get DNA and some other things, but not a chromosome count, all right? That's done by living white blood cells. Now then, first of all, in this analysis, I took the blood into a laboratory in Israel. I asked one of the people I work with in, in antiquities where it's a good laboratory that does reliable work, and they said such and such, such and such. I took it. I just said, please examine this blood and tell me what you can tell me about it. All right? They said, well, look, we're going to reconstitute it. We're going to put it in normal saline and keep it at body temperature for 72 hours with uh, gentle swirling, all right? That's their business. That's great. I said, now, I want to be there when you check it out. They said, fine. So I was back. They checked it out. I said, now, uh, they said it's human blood. We can tell that. They did whatever tests they need to do. And then I said, take some of the white blood cells and put them in a growth medium. body temperature for 48 hours. And they said, well, that'll do no good because it's dead blood. I said, would you please do that for me? 
And they said, okay, we'll do it. So anyway, I said, I want to be there when you take it out and examine it. So I was back there. They took it out, examined it under the microscope. And the one technician called the other one over there. And then they called the boss over there. And they were talking Hebrew a mile a minute there for a little bit. And they looked at me and they said, Mr. Wyatt, this human blood only has 24 chromosomes in it. Everybody else has 46. You see, 23 from your mother, 23 from your father, 22 autosomes from your mother, 22 autosomes from your father. You get an X from your mother, you may get an X or a Y from your father. All right? This blood had 23 chromosomes from the mother's side. Sorry, it's way up here. One Y chromosome only. You see, the child could not have developed if they hadn't had the autosomes from the mother. So all of his physical characteristics were determined by his mother's side of the family. Her autosomes. His maleness was determined by this one Y that came from the source, not a human male. Then they said, this blood is alive. And then they said, whose blood is this? I said, it's the blood of the Messiah. Sure, you those men's lives have changed. So he went back later and came back to that lab, and they had become Christians, these lab technicians. So the blood has 24 chromosomes. You and I have 46. The, this blood of Jesus has 23 from Mary and one Y6 determinant chromosome from God to designate a male child. So no human father was involved. It's just there's no autosomes from a human. So this shows he was born of a virgin birth. And this is what the world's going to hear about when the Ten Commandments come out. Also, this blood evidence will come out. So Mr. Wyatt shot 600 photographs of the temple furnishings, and they would always turn out blurry. And finally, he figured out, well, I guess God doesn't want me to show this to people. I guess he wants me to, to not share the photographs with folks. But... Eventually, he figured out that God did not want him sharing it. And so I ran into this person that said that Ron White gave them the clear photographs of the Ark of the Covenant, but I wasn't allowed to look at them. So this is the sword that we have up here, 1 Samuel 21. The priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you slew us in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here, wrapped in the cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it, for there's none other save that here. And David said, there's none like that. Give it to me. And so that is the Goliath sword. And a friend of mine sent me this picture, uh, Jim Pekoski, of Moses with the Ten Commandments with Mount Sinai in the background, a dramatic uh, superhero picture. But it looks like similar, similar to Paleo Hebrew like we have up here. And then these are the uh, Ten Commandment stones, it starts at the top right with the first commandment. And then the second, at the bottom, it starts the third commandment. And then the left tablet continues down to the end of the fourth. And then we have the fifth through tenth on the right. And you can see here where it says, you shall not, you shall not, you shall not, you know, in a row here. So now Jessalyn Johnson who wrote the song, Special Music. All right, here she is. A uh, nurse and Methodist like Ron, former coworker, tells about what said happened, what he said happened in the lab in Israel. It's not good blood. The white cells are alive and alive in the dish. And we want to know 
who's the one who used this? And he said, it's the one who did sign. And he said, they, he said, they thought I was crazy for asking for a promise to come, but they are the ones that went crazy when they saw what happened. And uh, he was telling me about telling somebody this story. And he said, they asked me, well, did that change their lives? He said, I don't know if it changed their lives. I took my report and left. Later, he said, as recording, with Terry died, he said, their lives were changed. So he had to go back and talk with the black people to find out that their lives were changed with finding out that that was the blood of their Messiah. Some have said that there's never been any paper lab report issued on the blood test. I mean, that doesn't make sense. The most important lab test you'd ever have done. But there's three witnesses whom Ron confirmed uh, there were reports or certificates. One was Henry Groover. He told about three lab reports on the blood that were verified in front of him by a document specialist at a full gospel businessmen's convention. My name is Henry Groover. Uh, I'm with Joyful Sound Ministries uh, in Woodbine, Iowa. And uh, I worked for many years with Ron White, traveled uh, many places with him met him in Jerusalem, then back to Jerusalem and parts of the Middle East with him, to Turkey, to Egypt. And uh, Ron Wyatt shared with me the certificates of the, the documentation of the lab reports uh, from Jerusalem, Germany, and America. Three laboratories where the blood was tested that he scraped off of the sarcophagus and the area where the crack, the blood came down through the crack from the center cross hole onto the sarcophagus that held the Ark of the Covenant. I was in the Southwest Regional Convention of the Full Gospel Businessmen in January of 1998, 19, yeah, 1998. No, 89, get that right, 89. That was in the year that I met him in April. I was with Ron Wyatt in 1989. Uh, uh, anyhow, Demas Shakirin was there. The lawyer for the Full Gospel Businessman was there at the table. And a document specialist from out of Los Angeles. We were there. Ron brought his certificates from his lab reports, from all of the different lab reports that he had. But I want to focus on just these three certificates. This seemed to be the real interest of the, of the document specialist. He inspected the three different lab reports from Jerusalem, Germany, and America of the blood that went on the mercy seat. He looked them over. He, he literally had documentation for the labs the technicians, and the listing of every, every test that was done, he had the numbers. He inspected those certificates with different levels of magnification. He looked them over very carefully, checking them with his documentation. He looked at Demas Shakarian, and he said, I would verify the authenticity of these documents to the highest court of this nation. Now, what that was, was the, the analysis of the blood of the X and the Y chromosomes showing very clearly from all three labs the same response. This is blood of a male factor. It is blood that proves it has the chromosomes that a mother, but there is no blood for the chromosomes proving an earthly father. And that's the three the three tests that he inspected along with others, but I was an eyewitness. I sat right beside him, watching him inspect these documents from these different laboratory tests. So Justin's uh, going to talk about the lab report. That, that there, was, there was a, uh, a man who was a specialist at, at uh, 
handwriting and documentation. And uh, then it was uh, declared authentic. And he said, uh, I would show you, but you're going to get to see it. And I never got to see it. Not yet, maybe I still will someday. So, and then jo Dr. Jonathan Gray, I emailed him and he said that Ron was going to show him the certificates, plural, of the next day, but then both of them basically forgot about it. But anyway, so Ron did confirm, you know, with him that there are certificates on the blood. And I believe the person that's holding the clear photographs of the Ark Cave furnishings, I believe that they would be holding these certificates on the blood. Now, Justin's going to talk more about items found in the Ark Cave. Talk about the table of showbread and its utensils. The altar of incense, the candlestick. Is it is it like this? Uh, the way people used to be depicted in pictures. He says, "No. How else can you walk along that?" So it's this way. He well, said it's really tall. But I can't tell yet just how tall it is because there are still some rocks on me. I gotta move those rocks first. And later I forgot to ask him how tall it was. The table of showbread and the altar of incense and the ark of the covenant all have bells and pomegranates all the way around the, the top. Um, later, not long before he died, I asked him if he if the uh, Sensor was there, and he said yes. I asked, does it have gold chains like is depicted in, in pictures? He said yes. So I thought I'd ask one more question. I didn't usually ask him questions, I just listened to what he had to say. And he said, I asked if there was, uh, if there were bills and pomegranates around the sensor. And he said, there is a bell and pomegranate theme throughout. So I took that as a yes. Uh, the boards, I've told you about the golden boards. Uh, I haven't found anybody that Rob had told that to. Other than me. The boards of the tabernacle, the three walls, the boards covered in gold, <coughs> made of acacia wood, they were about 30 or so inches wide. And about 17 feet tall. And Ron said, Justin, I used to wonder where did they find acacia trees big enough to make boards that size? He said they didn't. They were just pieces put together and clamped together and then overlaid with gold. He said, and then they, they weren't plain, they weren't smooth, they were still bumpy. But he said they were very beautiful. And I'm like, wow, it's the gold, heavily covered gold boards with all, with all the shapes and the seven branch candlestick that would reflect, reflect, reflect everywhere. It'd be like a room full of diamonds. It would just, everything reflecting, reflecting. That would be beautiful. So the blood will be a testimony of truth. We're told in 1 Timothy 2, for there's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. This is a future event, a testimony of him. We believe this blood will be the testimony that will be shown to the world when the Ten Commandments come out. The blood of Jesus will also come out and it will show it will testify of him as really being the Messiah, the Son of God. First John 5, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his son. This is the blood. It will be a testimony. And this is the testimony that God has given us, eternal life. And this life 
is in his son. So the blood on the mercy seat is an organized preservation of Jesus' sinless life, his sacrifice, his witness, and the world's going to see this. So the Ark of the Covenant the Ark is also called the Ark of his testimony. It's a holding place for evidence. The Ten Commandments were placed in there, a testimony from God. Aaron's rod that budded was kept there as a sign against the rebels. The golden pot of manna showing God's provision for his people. The blood of animals, a testimony of the old covenant. The law of Moses or the Torah scroll was in the back of the ark. The blood of Jesus, a testimony of Jesus' divinity. His redemption of mankind confirming the old and new covenants. And so Daniel 9.24, it'll be heard earlier. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision of prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, some people wonder, what is the most holy? Well, we see some other versions here. The most holy place was called that because the most holy was in there. We see here in RSV, it says here, and to anoint a most holy place, the New Living Transmission, Translation, to anoint the most holy place, English Standard Version, to anoint the most holy place. And so we can see here, it also says to the last one here, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy. This was Jesus' sacrifice, to make an end of sin, and to anoint the most holy place. And that it did. It fell down on the mercy seat. It fell on the Ark of the Covenant. That cave is the most holy place. It is holding all the temple furnishings. Now Jesus' blood put an end to sin, atoned for our sin, anointed the most holy, the Ark of the Covenant. Now Mr. White answers, why don't the Jews just go in there and take the Ark? He's saying there's an Ark in the cave. Well, why don't the Jews just go take it? I was curious, as significant a finance is, why doesn't the government confiscate the whole thing? Why doesn't the government confiscate it? Okay, uh, this gentleman has said that's as significant as this is, and I might add that's valuable. Why have you just read uh, the government just confiscated it and told me to get lost? Uh, is that basic of what you're asking? All right. The, uh, there were six Kohathites or descendants of Kohathites who, according to the old system, were, shall we say, qualified or acceptable for the purpose of moving the Ark of the Covenant about. Right? Six of them went in there to carry it out. They were going to put it in a safer place. And they were going to build a temple to put it in so they could start blood sacrifices. All six of them died of a massive brain hemorrhage before they even got to the chamber. So the Israeli government would have confiscated it and got rid of me, but I'm the only person that they know of that can go in there and help without dying. And of course, this proves something to them. It's that that proves that non-Jews don't have souls. Because if you had a soul, you would die. Uh, anyway, bless their hearts. I could have believed the same thing if that's what I've been doing. Okay, so that's why. That's you now, God does things, you know, and nobody can interfere with it. So he wants this shown, and he wants it done his way. And so nobody can do anything other than what he wants done. So now what, let's look at the scenario. What if the Jews had really accepted Christ? What would have happened? Can you imagine all the people, you know, accepting Jesus, the leaders accepting Jesus? Think how joyous that would have been. The Messiah, the Messiah, wonderful. And then one day Jesus would say, I'm the Passover lamb. Cut my throat. Let me bleed out. Take my blood in and anoint the most holy. What? Yes. It would have been, you know, a simple death for him if death is simple. But because of the rebellion of the people supporting apostate leaders and not doing anything about it, Jesus had to be tortured to death 
to get that blood on the mercy seat. That's the big difference between following God and not following God. There's consequences. And so I'm standing here over the crossal area and we're gonna take a look at this video I ran across of a frequency detector around that area searching for gold. This frequency detector is being set to look for gold. And we're gonna see if it could detect the Ark of the Covenant. Let's see if we have visual evidence of 600 pounds of gold being under this location. So this is a frequency detector. Everything gives off a different frequency. This thing has been set to detect that frequency that gold gives off. And this is in front of the cutouts again. You see the cutouts to the left here. Those are the benches we've seen before. This is a $700 instrument. It's not a coat hanger. Okay, this is an electronic device. It's a long range frequency detector that can detect gold from a distance. And we're talking about 600 pounds of gold. Uh, it's pointing back over to the cutouts over here to the right. We see the cutouts to the right. So it's searching. Oh, it's pointing to where I was standing in the first picture. Amazing. So when it spins, it means that the gold is below. So it's searching here. And so now they're saying the gold is below that area. So this is like the other edge of the Ark of the Covenant. So it's pointing to the cliff face. He's gonna to walk toward it. Now it's starting to spin. So he's at the edge of the arc here over top of it. So he's still over top of it. Now he gets right near the cliff face and it stops. And so it's pointing correctly to the left over here toward the cutouts. So he's getting near the cutouts right here. And it's starting to spin because it's at the edge of the Ark of the Covenant. 
So friends, this is visual evidence. Hey, the gold is right here where the cross hole is supposed to be. This lines up with what Mr. White said. And now he's just past it. So now it will spin again because he's over top of it. So it's pointing back toward the cliff face. And now it's starting to spin. So it's you know confirmation after confirmation that the Ark of the Covenant is, is down there. So anyway, so each time it confirmed the Ark of the Covenant, there were 35 test results, and they each confirmed that the Ark of the Covenant is down there. Uh, Ron White spoke highly of Wilbur Bishop, who helped him with the discoveries. He funded the 1960 trip out the Noah's Ark. We'll see a little bit of that later. But he was an Adventist near Chattanooga. And Ron... Uh, so Wilbur was a near constant companion of mine over the next several years, visited the Red Sea Crossing, Sodom and Gomorrah, the pyramids of Egypt, worked tirelessly in the Ark of Covenant excavation. He's one of the very few people who knew the exact whereabouts of the Ark and promised, as promised, carried that secret to his grave. But his daughter said when he was terminally ill that he confessed to her that he viewed the Ark Cave in person. He was head of the Seventh-day Adventist Archaeological Society. Uh, my name is Carolyn G. Bishop. My father's name was Wilbur Arnold Bishop. My mother, Helen Williams Bishop. Uh, they were great believers in the Bible, as I am. And he had a passion to find Noah's Ark. And he, along with some of his pals, Elder Crawford and uh, a doctor down in Alabama and wherever. And they went to Mount Ararat many times and spent a fortune and finally decided that this, they kept describing the ark as square or like a barge and that it says can't be, so we had to see it. Finally, he just said it was a tourist trap. But they were making big money off the helicopters and off the guides and all that sort of thing. And so he just pulled up stakes and left. Then there was uh, the pictures that came out in, I believe it was Life magazine, and um, showed boat-shaped figures over in Turkey. And Daddy got excited about that. And, uh, Ron asked Dad to help him with this project. My daddy had had uh, coal mines in uh, Grundy County off of Signal Mountain, just over Chattanooga. And so he knew how to enforce the tunnels that they have to make to get to places, the coal miners. So Dad was very caring about Ron and his project and he would go and check and he would go over and work and he didn't need an invitation he just whenever he could he would go over and work well he went over the last time he went over uh he was there uh, ron would dig out the rocks and daddy would pull them in a bucket out well, Dad was coming back from one of these trips of dumping rocks on the other side of the road, and out spurts this young man that was a relative of someone working in the garden tomb. And Dad said his eyes were just terror, just terror in his eyes. In his voice, he kept saying, what's in there, what's in there, what's in there? Just as fast as he could say it, and he was sprinting past Daddy. He didn't look at Dad. He didn't stop. He just disappeared in the distance, screaming, what's in there? What's in there? 
So dad was afraid that Ron, maybe something had caved in or something. So he went and got down to Ron. And my dad was a slight built man. It wasn't very difficult for him to get in there. And he was used to doing it. And he went in and he found Ron just like he was uh, stunned or in shock. And he was just sitting over against the wall. And there was a hole across from him. And uh, dad said, are you okay? Well, what's all of this? And dad, he says, take the flashlight and see what's in there. What scared that boy? And so obviously he hadn't checked it himself. So dad took the flashlight. My dad wasn't afraid of anything. He took the flashlight and he shone it in that cavern. The hole in the cavern was big enough to where my daddy could get through it. But Ron refused to let him go. Ron was big shoulders and a big guy. And he was afraid that it would collapse and all kinds of stuff, and he wouldn't let Daddy go in. And he wasn't going in. But when Daddy shone the light around inside of the cavern, I think it was a little to the left, there was a long row of dried pelts. And there were several layers of dried pelts. And on top of that were dried boards. So they'd evidently been there for centuries. And a forward to the right was, quite a ways to the right, was this big a stone sarcophagus sort of a thing with the lid had been knocked ajar. Part of it had been broken off and was very much askew. And they figured that that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. But um, they had to wait because Ron wasn't about to let Daddy go in there. And although they had other equipment and cameras and everything, you know, they had to shut up and they closed it off and they went back to the hotel. And the next morning, Ron went to the uh, Department of Antiquities and told them what he'd found and tried to register his claim. And so they allowed him to register his claim, but they warned him, if either of you tell this to anybody, it will be your life at stake, or the life of your family at stake. And of course, my dad's a real believer in the powers of the Mossad, and Ron was certainly not wanting to depart this earth very soon, so they had to keep it quiet. And daddy had said, sis, whatever you do, my dad was terminally ill. And he didn't usually confide in me with things like that. But I was very flattered that he had, and I love him for it. And so I didn't tell. I didn't tell anyone until it was made public. But believe me, it's a very interesting subject. And I truly believe with all my heart, and God strike me dead if it's not true this moment, that he found the Ark of the Covenant. And that my daddy was one of the first people to see where it was in that cavern. Now, in the Bible, it mentions several different types of heavens. Uh, Paul said, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, such an one caught up to the third heaven. A third heaven, that must mean there's also a first and second. Well, the first heaven is our sky. The second heaven is the stars. And the third heaven is what? the new Jerusalem. And so let's take a look at this verse, Revelation eleven nineteen. And the temple of God was opened in heaven. And they were seen in his temple, the Ark of His Testament. There were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. Will hail be falling in heaven and earthquake in the third heaven and earthquake in the third heaven? Let's look at these words here. This heaven here is a Greek word, Uranus, through the idea of elevation, the sky. So it's saying here, and the sky of God was open here. The first 
excuse me, the, the temple of God was opened in the sky here. The heaven here is the sky. It's the first heaven. It's not the third heaven. Everyone thinks when they read this, this is the third heaven. This is a new Jerusalem event. But the heaven mentioned here, open in heaven, is the sky. We know of Revelation 14 of three angels. It also speaks of heaven. That's the sky. That's, the, that's encircling this earth. So this verse is saying the temple here is, is the cave. The cave. That's where the temple furnishings are. And so you can say, and the cave temple of God was opened in the sky heaven. And there were seen in his temple, the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings on earth. There were voices and thunderings on earth. And an earthquake. An earthquake happens on earth and great hail. Is there seven last plagues dealing with hail? This is an end time speech here. This is saying that when it's, a, when it's a sky event, that means it's a worldwide event. So everybody on earth is going to hear about this. They're going to see this eight millimeter videotape of Ron White removing the Ten Commandments stones. They're going to see on video the Ark of the Covenant. They'll see it on video. They'll see Jesus' blood. And so Revelation 11 is saying that this is going to be a worldwide event that everyone will see the Ark of the Covenant. Now, Ron White said that the angel in the cave told him when the Sunday law is enforced, the Ten Commandments will come out. So we're waiting for the Sunday law to happen. Ellen White says it happens in stages. And so at first it would just be a law saying we should keep Sunday. But then they'll say you better keep this law or else. That's when it's enforced. After that point, then the Ten Commandment stones will come out of the cave. And we're told in Acts 17, in the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. So he's going to stop winking at ignorance. People are going to be informed that Jesus was the Messiah. They're going to see his blood. They're going to ask forgiveness of their sins in Jesus' name. Ask the Holy Spirit to come in them and then keep the law of God that they're seeing with their own eyes. Okay, and everyone on earth will either receive the seal of God or the mark of the beast. There's no more winking at ignorance. Everyone will be held accountable. You have to follow uh, Yeshua, his blood, the Holy Spirit in you, and follow the Ten Commandments. So these are two groups in Revelation 14. Smoke of the torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night to worship the beast and his image. And whosoever receive the mark of his name, these folks receive the mark of the beast. But then the next verse, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So the latter group, they're the saints. They're keeping the Ten Commandments. They receive the seal of God, but this first paragraph, they receive the mark of the beast. So we're all going to make a choice, follow man's authority, be able to buy and sell, follow the Antichrist law, breaking the Ten Commandments, and receive the mark of the beast, or accept Jesus as our Savior, accepting the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, be obedient to the Ten Commandments, receive the seal of God, and no more winking at ignorance. So out of the cave will come the blood analysis, the tables of stone, the video of Ron Wyatt removing the tables of stone. And everybody will say on earth, who is that guy? What else did he touch? Noah's Ark, Red Sea Crossing, Mount Sinai, Sodom and Gomorrah. And so he will be affirmed through that videotape and people will see the Ark of the Covenant on that videotape. So Psalm 77, how true. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Our salvation has come through the sanctuary through Jesus' blood on that mercy seat. It was part of God's plan and it happened. So this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world for a witness to all nations and then the end shall come. So this, these discoveries are gonna help finish the gospel message to go around the world and Christ will return. He's coming very soon, friend. After lunch, we'll take a look at Noah's Ark, and then the evening program, we'll take a look at the Red Sea Crossing and the Mount Sinai. It was out there in February, March 
I got some great video out there with the drone footage and so forth. So anyway, thank you so much for listening. I appreciate it.